What I aim to do with this talk is to empower you to do. And when I mentor my staff, a number of ex staff are here, and they know that they often get asked, come and have a smoke. I don't smoke. Good, come and watch me. I often pull out a cigarette and say, you know, life is a bit like a cigarette at times, where the shit that you have to do is the white bit, and the stuff that you like doing is the brown bit. The trick is to turn the white bit into the stuff that you want to do and understand there's always going to be a bit of stuff that you have to do. Um, I'm going to keep that in. Uh, so, so really, um, as I thought about this talk, it, it was really this notion of, in, in this 20 minutes that I've got, how, how, can I, how can I give you empowerment about how to do stuff? Now, the, the thing is that we've heard so much here and uh, and, and I've started to notice a few things, and I was sort of wondering when I started thinking about this talk is like, is the stuff I'm going to tell them just, you know, it's not really research, this is my observations of how I do stuff. But over the last three days, I've noticed that there are so many common themes. And I'm just going to take you through this. And really, my objective here is to hopefully leave you feeling inspired, but uh, get you to be able to actually do stuff. And I, and I know in this audience, and, you know, you sort of sit there and you sort of see, you know, mild mannered Nick Jaffe. The underachiever, and uh, <laughs> and if you're in a situation in your life where you're sort of saying, I, I don't really know what to do next. I don't know what my passion is, and I'm trying to find something. And it's like, oh, and then you see Hamed, and you go, Jesus, I, you know, I thought I had a few issues going, but you know, like, so it's almost like it worried me that you know maybe it could have left some of us just feeling perhaps a bit inadequate or not sure or what to do, and thinking the gap is too high. So really, what I'm trying to do is let you understand maybe and give you some knowledge but allow to apply it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is some dreams are impossible. When I come home from hospital when I was born, probably four days old to the age of 15, the first sound I heard every morning was the sound of horses hooves. I lived in Flemington. Uh, where I lived there were stables all around me. And every day I'd see these horses. Um, I could walk out the back door and there were stables in the back lane. The best trotting stable in the country was about 100 metres um, up the end of my street. And I, I, I loved horses. Um, and from the age of about eight, I started working in horse stables, both trotting and racehorse stables, for free. Um, I'd, you know, jump on a horse's back, you know, no saddle, no bridle, sometimes just the mane and work with them and all that stuff. And I had a passion and I had something I wanted to do. It was to be a jockey. Unfortunately, no horses carry 85 kilos in weight. <laughs> so when I got to about 15, I was like a stick figure because I didn't want to eat. Um, I, I sort of started to grow, you know, get to about five foot 10, don't eat, skinny as a bloody rake. And, you know, I get to about 58 kilos and I'm shit, I'm going to have to go over the jumps. I uh, get to 65 kilos and think, mate, that dream's over. So I um, finished school and um, went on the dole. And then, unfortunately, the government brought in this law that you had to be able to prove you'd applied for jobs. And um, oh, bugger. So I had this idea. So I wrote a resume that said my hobbies were drinking, gambling, and going to the pub, which was true, and still is. And uh, <laughs> And then I'd do cover letters. And then, you know, you go to the DSS, you know, oh, mate, yeah, no, nah, shit, no one to give me an interview, don't know why, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sign the cheque, thanks very much, see you in two weeks. Anyway, I, um, I sort of didn't know what I wanted to do, and I saw this job, and an oh, accountant in a steel foundry not far from where I was, so, oh, yeah, so I apply for that. Anyway, I get an interview, and I'm thinking, shit, like, who would be stupid enough to interview me? But uh, maybe I should get a bit of experience in the interview. And I met a guy who interviewed me, and his hobbies were drinking, gambling, and going to the pub. <laughs> and so he's, you know, first question, where do you drink? You know? <laughs> um, 
Oh, what do you drink? I drink cider. Why do you drink that? Oh, the alcohol content's more, you know, so you can get the same as beer. He goes, I've got something better for you than that. And I'm like, what? He goes, metho. Uh, okay. <laughs> then I, um, and he said, oh, what do you gamble on? He's like, racehorses. What do you know about racehorses? Well, I said, mate, a better question would be, what don't I know? Well, what racehorses do you know? Oh, I bought Dulcify home when he won the Cox Plate by seven lengths. My mate was a strapper. Oh, shit. So what? You've worked with Hayes? Yeah, yeah. And Tommy Hughes and hang out with all this and all that, you know, and it's like, Oh, wow. And then he's like, and I said, mate, well, what's this job? This accounting job, you know? And I said, I was, you know, reasonable at accounting at school. He goes, oh, you know, it's just a cadet accounting job. And um, we play darts for money every morning, tea, afternoon, tea, and lunchtime. <laughs> I'm in. So that was how I became an accountant. Uh, the, uh, I had that role for a couple of years, and then I went to an accounting firm. And uh, so I go in for the interview, and the... Um, the feedback I got or found out later from the people about five years later was what they said was like, geez, that kid's as smart as a whip, but he's that rough around the edges. He can't work in tax or audit. We'll put him in insolvency work. <laughs> so, and that's where I learnt to do. So the role of insolvency practitioner is you walk into a business and you say, let's say, Jeff, you're in trouble with the bank. And I walk and say, Jeff, hey, you owe us 100 million bucks. And you're like, shit, oh, can you pay it, Jeff? Like, what, now? Yeah, no, good, get out of my fucking chair. Um, and I'd start running the business uh, with my team. And the thing is, what we used to say in that game was, the way we thought about things was, you just had to do. You are in crisis and shit was flying everywhere. You know, truck driver, I'm ringing up, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to drive and get my stuff and I'm going to kill you when I'm there. Well, where are you? Wangaratta. Well, I'm leaving at five o'clock, mate, so you better speed up. Uh, but, uh, so, but it was the sort of notion, what we used to say is, you know, we think we're right, we hope we're right, we know we might not be. Never fall in love with a decision, make a decision, run with it, but always be willing to realise as soon as we're wrong because the worst decision you can make or the worst mistake you can make is to, to sort of lock into a dumb decision you've made. The fact that you're doing it with absolutely limited information and virtually no knowledge of what's going on doesn't matter. You have to decide. And I actually was pretty good at that. Um, but over a period of doing that for about 13 years, it sort of, I started to feel that, you know, I wasn't really creative, you know. I was good at what I did and, you know, but it just wasn't really that fulfilling and, you know what, I'd lock in and I'd be a manager at the firm I was at and, you know, that, had what, that was what my life was. Um, so I'd sort of done a thing which I often say to people is, the hardest corner to get out of is the one you paint yourself into. So I'd painted myself into this corner of non-creative, good at what I do, but, you know, never really going to do much of my life. I then, um, I'd always wanted to go and work overseas and uh, I, I had two young kids and my wife was pregnant with our third and then I got an opportunity for secondment. So you would have thought, you might say no, but we both said I was 30, yep, let's go and do that. So we had three kids under four uh, and I'm working in the UK and sort of gets towards the sort of end of 93, early 94. And I'd been hearing about this thing called the internet and the information superhighway and What's, what is that thing, you know? And it's like, oh, there's three million people on it. What, what, what is it? You know, um, and there's four million people on it. Oh, shit. There's five million people on it now. It's like, I'd be fucked if um, there's people doing some shit I don't know about and five million of the buggers are doing it. I'm going to go and find, look at the internet. I'm going to sort out the internet. I'm going to find out what this internet is. So I went to an internet cafe and uh, walked in and said, show me the internet. Anyway. <laughs> Blokes here like, oh, okay, well, it does this, and you sort of have this mosaic browser thing, and you look at this computer, and so who owns it? No one. Just uses the, you know, computers at one end and telephone wires and stuff. Huh. I said, mate, this is going to change everything, isn't it? And he's like, yeah. I said, fuck it, I'm going to be the best internet guy in Australia, notwithstanding that I was an accountant in the UK. But, um, <laughs> and... And the, the thing is, and the message that I have seen almost with everybody get up here, you know, Jeff, I was a traveller, I know nothing about the travel industry, let's start a travel company, you know. You, you see, you know, uh, Jez, you know, I don't know anything about this stuff, I'm going to start a, a movement, you know. It's just, the thing is, a good doer sort of gets this purpose or this passion or something inspires them, but they don't know what to do. And that's okay. Because when you don't know what to do, you can't ever make a mistake because you can't be wrong. You can't know you're wrong. So you just got to do something. So what I did was think, well, uh, you know, I'm going to immerse myself. And I, it sort of was a bit like you at school, you know, sort of go to work during the day, six hours every night, you know, looking up, reading everything, taught myself to program, realised whilst I could do it, I'd never be great at it and I'd never be passionate about it. 
And what started to happen was the, con the concepts that I started, I started delivering online training in the firm I was working with in, you know, sort of 94. Um, uh, started publishing and doing electronic publishing and all this sort of stuff and automated the way that we did um, all of the insolvency work in the UK firm where I was at. So I just, I just fell in love with this thing and the possibility. I came back to, an, to Australia in uh, 96. Second day I was back in the office, I was still doing insolvency work. Some guy walks in and says, hey mate, you know something about the internet, don't you? I'm like, yeah. It's like, oh, well, I'm supposed to attend, you know, represent our group at a meeting because Deloitte's thinking about doing its first website. Um, anyway, so I go to the meeting, by the end of the meeting, everyone's like, we don't know shit, can you build it? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, so again, that, that sort of gave me this sort of opportunity. And again, it was what I put in and it was a bit of serendipity, but it was from doing. And, you know, it was sort of, again, not knowing what to do is almost the best place you can be. One, because you're not starting with the way that everybody thinks you should do it. Um, but it's about sort of learning by doing and understanding, you know, I do that and hmm, that's good, but, you know, it's continually move. And I started an e-business consulting group at Deloitte, which then, we then bought a web company called Eclipse, which then became Deloitte Digital, which is now 15 countries and probably the biggest web mobile dev firm in the world. And it started here in good old Melbourne. Um, so that's great. I'm a good doer. But what I sort of realised then, that quote, you know, from Aristotle, where the, world, the needs of the world and your talents cross, it was about doing stuff that mattered. So I loved and I was passionate about what I did. I loved developing the people that I worked with. And, you know, anybody who sort of knows me knows that we've got this massive extended network of ex-employees and we all still do stuff together. And many of them have gone on to do great things with startups. And I even had the pleasure of having as a part-time employee the great Ross Hill. So um, it's, I've got Eddie now. So it's just fantastic, a brilliant network. But um, on the 5th of February 2009, I had a, uh, a panic attack. I suffer from depression, have done for many years, and I was debilitated. I couldn't get out of bed. I was just, and I don't know if anybody who's suffered from depression, but it was, you know, literally the black dog, the world in the size of a pin and couldn't move. On the 7th of February 2009, um, I knew that it was probably going to be the worst day in Victoria's history. At about midday, I walked outside. It was 49 degrees. I felt where the wind was going. And I started to get a bit worried because my parents and all live in a place got up a plenty. Um, I started looking on the web, um, everything collapsed. Uh, then I, saw, I was on Twitter, so I started looking at Twitter and I see sort of about an hour and a half later photos of Wandong on fire. It's two hills away from my parents in law. I ring them and said, get out, get out, it's going to hit you and it's not going to stop. The house burnt down at two o'clock. At 7.30 that night, unbeknownst to me, my sister-in-law's house got burnt down in Flowerdale. On the 12th of February, my sister-in-law came to my house hysterical and she had pages of handwritten notes from people from Flowerdale who'd been in that town. There was not one emergency service thing came there until 11th of February and when it did it was the army and they roadblocked the town and they prevented people from bringing water in to keep fighting the fires to the house because they were told get people out and don't let people in. So she had these hands, pages of handwritten notes and I was, I was sort of outraged. I had to do something but what can I do? So I sort of said, fuck, um, I'm going to write a blog, I'm going to set up a blog, I'm going to write all these handwritten notes down. And the last paragraph of that blog post says, I don't know what to do, but if you read this or see this, here's my number, here's the pub's number, just help us do something. Um, so I did that. And I said, well, that's great, you know, every blog on the internet, how's anyone going to know it exists? So then I ring Ross Hill. And then I say, mate, can you tweet this? And then I ring a number of others and we started tweeting. 20 minutes time, three OWs on the phone. Um, starts talking to me about what's going on. I start to be able to organise stuff. Um, I've got, you know, I've sent my sister-in-law back, said, I I'll sort this out, don't worry, we'll, we'll work stuff out. Um, we'll, we'll get food. And then I, um, I, I went up there on the Saturday, um, worked out how to get around the roadblocks, snuck into the town and just sort of said, you know, what do you need? And um, you know, what are you doing? We, we need this. And my sister-in-law said to me in these exact words, she said, you know, you used to have a job about dealing with fucked up um, companies. We have a fucked up town. This place is burnt to the ground. It was like a, it was literally, it, it was just devastated. 250 houses out of 300, just literally burnt to the ground. Never seen anything like it. Um, and I, I tell you, actually, a bushfire is a good way to recover from a panic attack as well, though. Um, <laughs> 
but it was that sort of thing. One moment I was debilitated, but then it just sort of said, oh, I've got to do something, you know. I, I'm sure, I don't know what to do, but I'm good at doing. So the, um, so we, she said to me, will you, will you, can you come and help? Can you help lead this? And I said, yeah. Um, so we just started doing stuff, you know, and I, I hooked up with a guy called John Burgess, who, um, he was a, a, a sort of town leader type guy. He wasn't the appointed leader, but he was just the best get things done man I've ever met in my life. And we hooked up together and um, we, we sort of said on about the 19th of Feb, you know, we don't blame anybody for this, but the government is overwhelmed and doesn't know what to do. We reckon that in Flowerdale, we, we can rebuild this town and we think we can do it ourselves. And we think that we can actually create a model for others to recover after disasters. Now, how you're thinking that within 14 days of one of the greatest disasters in this country is quite mind-boggling. But the thing about it was we didn't know what we were doing, but we did a few things like every other town was like, keep out, we don't want you here. We were like, come in, because if you see how bad this shit is and you can do something, you'll feel like you have to. We, um, the fact that we were findable and put ourselves out there and we were open-ended about how we did stuff, I got a phone call from Sheikh Mohammed of Dubai's Dali Stud people. They're like, you're the only community we can contact. The Sheikh helps communities that he works with. Uh, we've got one and a half million dollars. Um, can you, can you, can we work with, directly with you? Yes, you can. Um, and to this day, we still work with Dali. They're a fantastic organisation. And, you know, somebody tells me there's this guy called Bob Greensburg, uh, Bob Dixon in Greensburg, Kansas, the worst disaster in the US history for a tornado. Um, should see how they've done the rebuilding. I woke up at six o'clock that next morning because I had to go to Sydney. As most people may know, I'm not an early riser, um, particularly after yesterday or third, Thursday night or whatever. But the, uh, the, so I look up what time is it in Kansas? Oh yeah, I pick up the phone, Greensburg Town Hall, I want to speak to the mayor. Hello, Bob Dixon. Oh, g'day Bob, my name's Pete from Australia. Um, <laughs> mate, I don't, I don't I don't really know why I'm ringing you, but have you heard about these bushfires? Are they in Melbourne? I'm like, yeah. You know, I'm coming to Melbourne for a conference in a couple of months. I might come up and see your folk, you know? The thing is, a doer doesn't say, wow, look at Greensburg. A doer just says, pick up the fucking phone and see what happens. A doer says, what is that logical next step? What, it's, it's not being better. It's just saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out. I see something interesting. I'm going to reach out. The, the other thing is a doer sort of, I use this term, give people something to say yes to, you know? You know, Dali, when they rang us, were like, well, what do you need? And we hadn't really stepped back and thought, and we thought, well, what are we trying to do here? And we come up with the words of sustainable, empowered community. And we went to Dali with, this is what the community is telling us they need. Can you help us with this stuff? That, you know, not a, oh, we're not sure. And, you know, it was like, give them something to say yes to. Because what you find is governments are not really capable of leading, but they love to get on the, ba on the coattails of a leader. They love to sort of say, look what we did. And a good doer isn't so worried about being someone. They're really worried about doing something. And if somebody else wants to take the credit and this thing sustains and works, that's okay. Another sort of incident that really mattered to me was my daughter, Hannah, um, I was sitting outside around the fire one night and she comes in and says, Dad, uh, I've got a problem at school. Oh, yeah, what's the problem? Um, oh, they won't let me take my girlfriend, Savannah, to the school social. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm going to go two minutes over, so sorry. She just put the two-minute sign up. Um, but I'm last, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> so she says, um, I've got this, uh, I've got this you know, problem. They won't let me take Savannah. And... Uh, it's like, oh. She didn't sort of say, Dad, you know, actually, I'm gay. And because, you know, we, she's a bit feisty, so you don't discuss that stuff. And it's like, okay, what have you done? Um, well, they won't let me take her. I've had 700 girls sign a petition at the school. I've done this, but I'm just totally roadblocked. I said to Hannah, I said, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to fight them? And she's like, yeah. I said, um, you know, if you fight these, you're going to get exposed. You're going to have to go at the front. You're going to have to take these hits. You're going to have people really abuse you badly in that. And she said, you know, Dad, if I lay down this time, what happens next time and the time after that? And if I don't stand up and do this fight, what about the kid who can't stand up and fight like I can? And to me, that's the epitome of a doer. It's courage. It's gumption. And, you know, we tried a range of channels to get stuff going on. Um, we went to Equal Opportunities, which is the greatest waste of time in the world. Um, we, we got to the point where if we were really going to fight it, 
from a, a sort of traditional channel. We had to actually go and spend shitloads of money on a court case. But I'd been reaching out, Hannah had been reaching out, and we'd been talking to these people at the Safe, Safe, Sex, or Safe Schools Alliance, which is a sort of research group from La Trobe Uni that helps um, schools understand how to deal with, um, you know, non, whatever you call them, transgender, all that stuff, LGBTI. <laughs> and, um, and we'd sort of got to the point where at the end of the road, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then a journo rings up and says, hey, you've been talking to the Safe Schools Alliance, and I'm interested in writing a story about, you know, the lives of kids who are gay at schools, and they said to ring you. And it's like, where are you going to run it? Oh, probably just the local newspaper. She rings up a couple of days later. I also did a bit of freelance for The Age. I showed the editor of the story, and they want to run it in The Age. Anyway, at midnight that night, I get a phone call from um, my niece. Hannah's on the front page of The uh, Age online. Um, <laughs> What the fuck? So what do I do when I have a situation like that? <laughs> Ross Hill, tweak this shit out. Let's make this go global. <laughs> At 1.30, my daughter runs in. Dad, we've hit, uh, we've hit the UK. <laughs> At 2 o'clock, Dad, we're in the Huff Post. <laughs> we hit 500 newspapers across the world in a two-day period. Um, my daughter went up and faced that media. The principal against the 16-year-old girl. My daughter, through truth, authenticity, and playing everything straight down the line, made that principal look like a complete fool. Three days later, the school um, called an emergency board meeting, issued an apology to Hannah, and adopted what I'd asked them to do in the first place, which was adopt the policy of the Safe Schools Alliance, which simply says, every event we operate at this school will be equally open to same-sex attract people. So that's a doer. So, the, the thing is, I've now retired as a partner of Deloitte, I work three days a week. The biggest question that I've had to ask myself is, you know what, I'm not a bad doer, but do I have an obligation to the world and humanity to keep doing what I can? Do I have an obligation to my family who've paid a big price for me, even when I'm present, not being present because I'm so wound up in the shit that I do? Um, and what about me? And for all of you, understand that that's an okay question. You don't have to do anything. You might not be in a position. Don't worry if you haven't got something to go walk out this door and save the world. If you know how to do and you get used to it, small moves, smartly made, set the big things in motion. So that's okay. So I moved to the country. And uh, on my 50th birthday last year, my wife gave me permission to have two horses. I decided I wanted to learn to connect with horses like I could when I was a little kid. I rang my sister, who's a horse nut. Uh, she had the same sort of clip-clop in the morning. And um, she said, you know, about five k's from where you live, one of the best horse whispers in the world, Carlos Tabo Naberi, uh, lives there. So I picked up the phone, said, hey, Carlos, can you teach people to be horse whisperers? He's like, yeah, no worries, where are you? I mean, up a plenty. I'll come around and see you. So every Monday, I have a horse whispering lesson. And I remember I saw this movie called Buck Brannerman, where, I don't know if you saw it, called Buck. He was a, he's a great horse whisperer, Buck. And he was leading a horse on a loose rope. And when he'd stop, the horse would stop next to him. And I just thought to myself, that is amazing. I do with that with my horse every day. So my dream of being a jockey wasn't the dream. It was what I thought the dream was. But my dream was, can I actually connect on a real sort of mental, visual level with an animal like a horse, because animals know body language so much better than we do. And that's what I do with my life. The rest of it I spend helping others do. I'm on the board of the Deloitte Foundation, the Reach Foundation, Circus Oz. I'm an adjunct professor at RMIT, and my whole life is about helping others do. So again, you don't always have to do it yourself. You don't always have to do it for others. But you know what? If you learn how to do, and you're willing to help and share that way, you can really make a huge difference at, across all levels. And when you leave here today, just take a few of these things about how do you actually do. And I know I've gone way over, and I know that lady's going to freak out, but <laughs> the key points. <laughs> Passion, belief, and commitment around a purpose. Start somewhere. Do something. Doesn't matter if you don't know what to do. Do something. Learn by doing. Aim, fire, adjust, like you're playing Angry Birds. Spend time to reflect, <laughs> you know? I've had the shot. What did I learn? How do I do it next time? And go again. And it doesn't matter being wrong, if you keep sort of having a mass amount of experiments and keep learning every time, 
you know, think long, play short, think long, play short, you'll do stuff. Give people something to say yes to. Be prepared to put irons in the fire. Treat this like a fucking quest that you are not going to let die and connect with others because it's through those connections and through reaching out, being open and sharing that serendipity happens and the world changes. So thank you. Thank you for everyone at the D lectures. Thank you. <laughs>